أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We seek the help and the blessings in the name of God, the most loving, the eternally merciful. Wa abdul salati wa tamma taslim ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa tahirin wa ashabihi wa tayyibin wa man tabi'uhum bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. We ask that God exalt our beloved, our master, our leader, Muhammad, and his immaculate family and his pure companions and those who follow them with excellence to the Day of Judgment. Uh, since we're going to be talking mostly about our muraqaba today, which is awareness, I will invite you and myself to take a moment to rest your gaze uh, towards the floor or to close your eyes. <coughs> Put your hands wherever they fall comfortably. Straighten your, your torso, as straighten your back as best you can and just just gently, gently lower your, your chin, just a little, just a little. So I invite you to just let's begin with awareness, with muraqaba that essentially we are spirits. We are ruh, that we are light. That is who we are in our origin before we were born from our mothers into this world. We were lights, it's pure consciousness suspended in space. And that spirit, that light that is at the very core of your being is entirely beautiful, is perfect, is absolute, is with Allah right now, back then and, and right now. That spirit is not from this world. You as spirit are a visitor. And you're here to bring goodness into the world. Everything good about you comes from that spirit. Everything pure, everything wholesome comes from that identity, your spiritual identity. And then I want you to uh, turn your awareness to the breath. Let's take a deep breath in. Feel your lungs. Breath that is like wind. Expanding lungs that are like trees. And breathe out. And 
at the end. And out. And in. And out. I want you to bring into your awareness that this breath is a gift. It's the most subtle of gifts that Allah has bestowed upon us. Just take a moment to be aware of your breaths as you inhale and exhale. You bring in oxygen that goes into your lungs, that nourishes your heart with oxygen that shines like a star, that radiates, that sends blood, life-giving oxygen, like a star shining light throughout your body. What a miracle. That heart that's, that's beating in your chest most of the time without your awareness, I want you to bring your awareness to your heart. Your heart is the object of God's gaze. Your, your heart is the object of God's gaze. The beloved of Allah, Allah bless him and grant him peace, said that God does not look at your bodies or your wealth. Rather, he gazes at your hearts and your deeds. And so now, I want us to as we, as we end this awareness practice, I want us to bring our attention to the sounds that we hear. What can you hear? What's the message? Everything in the heavens and the earth is an ayah. Everything in the heavens and the earth is evidence, is proof. Bring your attention to the chair or the, the cushion or the floor that you're sitting on that's supporting you, that's connected to the green, blue earth. We thank Allah for Grandmother Earth, for her support. her strength. <clears throat> Bring your attention to what's above you, 
the ceiling that beautifies this room, the roof that protects us from the elements, the sky full of beautiful stars, full of beautiful stars. Comets, meteorites, and planets all put there to remind us as an adornment, as a protection. All of this for you. We thank Allah for the sky the grandfather sky. For teaching us what it's like to show awe. And finally, without opening your eyes, or without lifting your gaze, if your eyes are open but lowered, Bring your attention to the people around you. To the bodies around you. To the spirits around you. Allah chose each person in here to share this moment with you. Each person is in here for a wisdom, a divine wisdom. Anyone could be here. Allah chose these people. And that awareness, I invite you to bring gratitude, thankfulness to heart for the people that are sharing this time and this space with you. That is a sacred relationship. That is a connection that was predetermined before you or I were ever a thing unremembered, before the creation of the heavens and the earth as we know them. Let us bring gratitude for the people that are around us, to our, to our right, people that are in front of us, people that are to our left, people that are behind us. I invite you to thank Allah for them, for their presence. None of them is insignificant. They're all here for you and you are here for them. Every body, every mind, every soul, every spirit is on a journey towards completion and perfection. And right now we share the road So with that, uh, dear brothers and sisters, when you're ready, when you're ready, uh, gently open your eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He invites us to be in a state of awareness in the Quran. There are uh, 
ayats that are mentioned in the last 10 ayat of the chapter of the family of Imran. Peace and blessings be upon him. The third chapter of the Quran. That begin, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, wa layli wal nahar. And the changing of night and day, la ayat, la ulil al There are proofs, there are messages, there are signs for those who possess innermost hearts. Those who awaken to their deepest reality. The heart is, a, is an organ of cognition and love, knowledge and love. The Ulul Albab are, are people that are knowers and lovers. These are the people that are able to read the signs that are in the heavens and the earth, that are in the changing, the alteration, the cycle of night and day, of life and death, of birth and renewal. Every moment for such people is a miracle. Or if you want to use more conventional language, every moment is magical. For Ulul Albab. Then Allah says, He begins to describe some of their attributes. And all throughout the Quran, Allah mentions the attributes of these, these special people, Ulul Albab. You can actually, you know, the next Ramadan, when you're reading the Quran, just highlight all the places where Allah describes Ulul Albab often translated as people of intelligence or people of wisdom or people of hearts. The labib is someone who's intelligent, who's wise, who's, who's living life from their innermost core, not just from their sensory organs, right? not just from what they see and what they hear, what they taste, what they smell, what they touch, but their, their inner organs, right? because we have, the Quran teaches us that there are extrasensory organs that we've been gifted with. We have physical sensory organs that give us information about the physical world so that we are able to navigate that world. We're able to derive benefit and give benefit in that world. We are able to avoid harm from that world. That's what our sens sensory, our five senses afford us. Great blessing. Even though scientists tell us at any moment we're only experiencing four or five percent of the physical world around us. Four or five percent. That's all, like what you're seeing right now is actually only four or five percent. Hey, sweetie. Only four or five percent of what's actually in front of you. When we look at the the cosmos, when we look at the galaxies and the stellar systems with the Hubble telescope or the James Webb telescope, we're only seeing four or five percent of the observable universe. That's it. That's it. Just enough so that we can survive. <laughs> and do some good while we're here. Just enough. Because if we were to see everything, most of us would go crazy. If you were to see every quark and every neutrino and every microbe and every virus and, I mean, I mean, have you seen some of these viruses and bacteria? Scary stuff. Right? We, we, most of us couldn't handle it. Allah just lets us see enough so we can benefit and avoid harm. Allah lets us know enough so we can worship Him. We know that we shouldn't be worshiping ourselves. We shouldn't be worshiping money. 
We shouldn't be worshiping power or influence. We should not be worshiping stone and metal, ideas, philosophies, ideologies. We shouldn't be worshiping trends. Allah gives us just enough knowledge not to overload our, our minds and our hearts. So Allah goes on to say about these people, they remember Allah standing, sitting, and when they lie down on their sides. Meaning that, and I, I was mentioning this the other night, just to use more conventional language, these people, ulul albab, the people who possess innermost hearts, because there, there's four words for heart in the Quran, the sadr, the qalb, the fu'ad, and the lub. The sadr is the outermost heart. We learn the Surah Al-Nas. That's the part of us that Satan, that the devil, the Iblis, may Allah protect us from him. The diabolical one, right? Diablos. That's the only part of us that he can have access to. That's the sadr. Allah doesn't say fi alladhi yuwaswisu fi kulubin nas. Allah doesn't say alladhi yuwaswisu fi af'aditin nas. Allah doesn't say alladhi yuwaswisu fi albabin nas. Alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas. He can only get access to the courtyard of your of your being if you're not in dhikr. But these people, ulul albab, they're always in dhikr. They're in dhikr of Allah, they're in remembrance of Allah, they're in awareness of the absolute reality. That's what Muslims seek. We're not, like, virtual reality and augmented reality are interesting. Virtual VR and AR are interesting, but they're just shadows of shadows of shadows of absolute reality, al-haq. Allah is absolute reality. Physical reality is interesting, it's beautiful, it's majestic, but it's, it's nothing compared to God. It's like comparing any number to infinity. Any number compared to infinity is what? Equals what? Zero. Zero. And so these inner sensory organs, my dear brothers and sisters, the, are activated through dhikr and fiqh. Right. They're activated through remembering, recalling, bringing into our awareness the absolute reality in all of our states. Whether we are standing, sitting, lying down, we're in a state of remembrance, awareness, recalling, ultimate reality. And then Allah says, this about them. And they meditate upon the form, upon the structure, upon the creation of the heavens and the earth. That's what they reflect upon. So you have these two spiritual practices that human beings have been gifted. The spiritual practice of dhikr and the spiritual practice of fiqh. Uh, why, yeah, people, there's a lot of people who drink liquor. A lot of people who drink liquor. Why, why do people drink liquor? Why do people, use drugs, narcotics, psychedelics, yeah, drink ayahuasca, and sniff mushrooms. Like, why do people do that? There's something inside of us that knows that there's more. We want more. Why do we s spend billions of dollars to send you know, shuttles into space and satellites into space. And 
we know there's more. There's something in our souls that crave, craves infinity, oblivion, transcendence, euphoria, happiness, bliss. These people, Ulul Albab, who are in this continual state of remembrance and 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 meditation, contemplation, reflection, they have found the bliss. And there's no, you know, liquor, you know, there's hangovers, right? You don't get a hangover from dhikr. You don't get a hangover from fikr. With liquor and other intoxicants, it's it's fleeting. The high is fleeting. Everybody wants to get high. The question is, what kind of high? I mean, that's what we should be telling people. Upgrade your high. Get a higher high. Get a high that doesn't destroy your body or your family or your finances or your brain or your liver, right? Dhikr, Imam al-Ghazali, Allah be pleased with him, Allah have mercy upon him and benefit us through him and his legacy and his teachings. He said that the key to remembrance of God, to dhikr of Allah is taqwa. It is reverence it's 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 revering god it's obeying god it's consciousness mindfulness of god that's the key that opens the door of dhikr like you're doing dhikr but you're not feeling it right you're not understanding it's not going beyond your tongue into the heart the key to open the door of dhikr is taqwa and taqwa takes some knowledge, right? Living within what is permissible and avoiding what's made impermissible by God, not because your parents want you to, not because the Imam, Imam Khalid is watching, right? Not because your friends are there, but doing it as part of your spiritual practice. Like I am living, I'm choosing to live in the halal because I want to be spiritually enlightened. I want to be spiritually awakened. I want to be able to not just believe in Allah, I want a relationship with Allah. I don't just want to believe and obey Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I want a relationship with him. I want to walk with him. I want to talk with him. That's much more interesting as a motivation for taqwa. I want to live within the halal, within what Allah has commanded, and avoid what's haram because I love Allah, because I'm grateful for life, for the opportunity. There's no other planet like this. They will look they will find places that are more livable or less livable. There's no place in the universe like this. The jinn wanted this planet. Iblis, like that's the that's the beef. That this is the primordial conflict between us and Satan. Satan wanted the job of being the Khalifa, Khalifa Tubafat, the successor, the representative of, of God on the earth. That this is the, um, even the angels. There's a really good movie with Nicolas Cage. Right? Most of his movies are. Yeah, I know. <laughs> City of Angels, anyone watch that? Yeah, amazing movie. Like when, when I watched it, I, I said, they had to have read about angels in Islam. They had to. Maybe they read about angels in every religion to write the screenplay for that. But one of the things you see in that movie is that the angels, they, this, this angel becomes a human. The experience of just eating an apple, like tasting an apple, it is awesome. And we don't 
we take it for granted because most of us were born with our, you know, our five senses. But have you seen those videos of people, of children or adults who are hearing for the first time? It just makes you, just people start crying. Now the people who are ula al-bab, they weep all the time when they eat apples. I know, because I've been around these people. They weep when they, when they hold a baby. They weep when they hear your salam, when they see your, your radiant faces. They weep because of how beautiful this experience, the human experience is. And then what does Allah say about these people? They say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. After having a consistent practice of dhikr, of remembrance of Allah, which is muraqaba, which is the state of awareness. After having a consistent practice of fikr, of reflection on Allah's signs, they come to this realization. And it's not, it's not, it's not a rational thought. It's, it's a spiritual realization. Because you can know that everything has a purpose. Right? We study that, right? Like you, you know, some of you are in the sciences, and you know that in an ecosystem, every organism, every being, yeah, animate or inanimate, has a function in the system. Right? It's really strange, because when you ask human beings, well, what's your function? People say, I don't know. I don't know why I'm here. And as Muslims, we've been taught to give this canned answer, right? I'm here to worship Allah. Well, how are you here to worship Allah? Like each of us is unique. Each of us is distinct. And what is your contribution to our collective worship of Allah? What is that? What is your life purpose? What is your mission? Why did Allah send your light your spirit here, why? Like these are existential questions that maybe have crossed your heart or your mind at some point. And when you find the answer, there is a joy, there's a peace, there's a bliss. They say, our loving Lord, Rabbana, Rabbana, our guardian, sustainer, our nurturing master, you did not create this in vain. This is not trivial. This is meaningful. Every moment, every being, every person, every animal, every plant, every rock, every mineral, every element, every compound, every atom is meaningful and important and necessary. When you realize this, everything changes. Even you, you are important. You are meaningful. You are so important that Allah willed your existence. He could have left you in pure potentiality. But he actualized your potential. with all the drama that he knew you were going to do. <laughs> all the hardship, all the heartache, and all the triumph, and all the, all the joy, all the happiness, Allah brought all of that, willed all of that into existence. <laughs> Absolute perfection belongs to you. <laughs> they say, none of this is, was created in vain. Absolute perfection belongs to you alone. They come to this realization. They, 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 they state it because they have entered into a spiritual state of realization of this truth. So save us from the chastisement of the fire. You know, if you go to Palestine, right beneath uh, the mount 
of olives, there's a place called Gehenna. Right? Anyone been to Jerusalem? Right? Yeah. Did you go to this place? It's called Gehenna. You couldn't get in. This is. You couldn't get, yeah, some people get turned away. This is the same root as our word Jahannam, which is one of the names, the one of the levels of hell. Why is it called Jahannam? Why was it called Gehenna by the Israelites, by the Hebrews, by the Jews? That's where they used to burn their trash. Right? They would take, you know, people still burn the trash. Like if you go to Gambia, like where I'm headed, you know, people still burn trash. Different parts of the world. So the idea was things that are no longer being used, or things that are spoiled, or things that are no longer serving their purpose, you put them in Ghana, in Jahanna, and you burn them. And so these people are saying there's nothing that Allah's created in vain. And so for me, the, the practice of Muraqaba, the, the third chapter in both the Book of Assistance is about, is a way of embracing a journey that leads to self-knowledge. And I'm going I'm to end with, with, with this point, inshallah. So Imam al-Haddad was a master, right? How many of you are reading the book, Book of Assistance? How many of you? Okay. So this book is one of the few books that I have come across that I can say with all honesty, with all honesty, if this is the only book after the Quran you ever read, you're good. You don't need to read anything else for your religious, for your spiritual well-being. Read this book and you will have everything you need to know for the rest of your life. There are not many books you can say that about. One of my teachers, uh, Sheikh Habib Omar bin Hafid, who's from the same family as the author of the Book of Assistance, Imam al-Haddad, I heard him say on more than one occasion to people, Read this book, the Book of Assistance, and don't go to from one chapter to another until you're living what's in the chapter you just read. Now you can read through it from beginning to end, but after you do that, after you kind of get a feel, a taste, go back and start reading the book with the intention of implementing what you're reading. He starts with the chapter, to my, you know, forgive me if I make a mistake, but to my recollection, he starts with the chapter of certainty, which has always, you know, why did he start with that chapter? Like, certainty is like, like that's the beginning. Certainty? We Usually we start with doubts. Yes or yes? <laughs> Let's be real. And doubts are not necessarily a bad thing. Like I tell people, if you have doubts about Islam or doubts about religion or doubts about Allah or doubts about the Prophet Sallallahu face those doubts. Bring those doubts into the community to, with, with teachers and with scholars. Let's, let's talk about it. Don't put them under the, don't hide them under the, the carpet. But you might keep hide, putting them under the carpet, under the rug until there's a big, mound of doubts that trips us up when we walk through the living room of our life. Usually we start with doubts, but what, what, what Imam al-Haddad is calling us to is to face our doubts, to cultivate certainty. And then there's a chapter on intention, Nia. Hey, there's a book called The Law of Intention. Like, this is good stuff. And he wrote this about 300 years ago, and he was blind. So he didn't actually write it, he, he dictated it. That book you, that you have, the Book of Assistance, was dictated by a blind man. Like all the stuff we're reading, that was all in his heart. I mean, anyone who's written a book, like this book up here that I helped to translate, I mean, 
just mapping out the chapters and the, the themes and how do you organize each I mean that takes a lot of planning and thought so for someone who's blind and he was blind as a child to do that and not just with that book but with many he, he authored many books right he speaks like he's someone who sees because he does see while his eyes were blind he had a heart that could see the section of Muraqaba is a section that's inviting us to lives of contemplation and that is a beautiful life a life of reflection a life of introspection a life of depth a life of meaning a life of purpose that's what he's calling us to in the third chapter now there I'll say this in, I'll say this in, uh, I'll say this in conclusion two things uh, both related to Imam al-Ghazali one related to Imam al-Haddad and two related to Imam al-Ghazali so Imam, al- Imam al-Haddad in that chapter he mentions a number of things Muraqaba is one kind of meditation in Islam. There's about nine different ways to meditate. Meditation is a part of our tradition. And the last time I was here, when we had our workshop on meditation in traditional Islam, we talked about that. There are different ways to meditate. Meditation has been a part of our tradition since the time of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. The Buddhists and the yogis do not have a monopoly over reflection and contemplation and meditation. It is part and parcel of our tradition. It is mentioned in the Quran, there are hadith about it, and we have scholars upon scholars upon scholars who have written books about it that are very sophisticated, very complex, and also very simple. So I encourage you, uh, as Imam Ghazali does in his books, to make reflection and muraqaba, being in a state of awareness and vigilance over your actions, over your thoughts, over your, your states, your emotions, being in muraqaba as a way of reflecting Allah's name, ar raqib One of Allah's beautiful names is ar raqib the ever watchful the ever aware. There is no time when Allah is unaware. There is no time when Allah does not see. He's always aware of you and your thoughts. And that is a beautiful thing. Imam Ghazali, he said that the key to dhikr is what? Taqwa. Consciousness of God, mindfulness of God, obedience to God for the pleasure of God. And then he says, dhikr, so taqwa is the key that opens the door of dhikr, and then dhikr is the key that opens the door of the unseen, of the spiritual universe that is not only around you, like, you know, the angels and the jinn and but also within you. Dhikr is the key that opens that door because we human beings are not just bodies. We are spirits. And you've been given organs that are able to perceive the physical world, as we discussed, so that you can navigate that world successfully. And you've been given organs that can perceive the metaphysical world, the spiritual world, so that you can navigate that world and avoid its harm and derive benefit from it and give benefit to it. But the key to consciousness of that world is remembrance of Allah. Abundantly. وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهِ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُوا Remember God abundantly copiously in order that you're successful. One of my teachers told me, 
Allah prepares us for a spiritual awakening, for spiritual life without telling us that's what he's doing. And the other religions that kind of focus on awakening, enlightenment, and you don't really see that in the Quran. Right? And then he says, Imam Ghazali said, and then knowledge of the unseen or, or perception, consciousness of the unseen world is the key that opens up the door to knowledge of Allah. What is it that you admire? Is it power? Is it beauty? Is it knowledge? Is it wisdom? Like what is it really that, that pulls you? That, you know, what is it? Whatever that is, there's an attribute of Allah that is the ground of its being, that is its source. So if it's knowledge, Allah is al His knowledge is absolute. And when you're able to gain some relationship with that name of Allah, you begin to experience knowledge like you've Again, it makes this the it, it makes all the knowledge that you know the greatest minds of this world have had look like nothing. Any number over infinity equals what? Yeah. Any limited knowledge compared to Allah's unlimited knowledge is like what? Zero. You can apply the same principle to beauty, to power. If it's power that you respect, I mean, we all, uh, different things move us, right? I'll end with this. Imam Ghazali has a beautiful book called The Alchemy of Happiness. al to Sa'ada. Anyone have that? Read it? Heard of it? Okay, a few of you? Good. I'm going to take her with me. <laughs> She's cute. She's cute. <laughs> How old is she? I have a two year. Yeah, not two years. Yeah, yeah, they can they could be buddies. They could be <laughs> running buddies. Alhamdulillah. So Imam Ghazali has a beautiful book called The Alchemy of Happiness, right? Which is what we're all looking for. Like America is based on this promise of what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. happiness. Looking for happiness. Sa'ad. That's the word for happiness in Arabic. Sa'ad. And he says, so if you have the book, it's really interesting because the, the, the first chapter, Imam Khalid, the first chapter is being Muslim. Right? There's a book, Being Muslim, Dr. Asad, Rasir, a book, Being Muslim. But what, what Imam Ghazali talks about in that first chapter, he says, to be Muslim, you need to know four things. And I mean, what do you think is the first thing you need to know to be Muslim. Anyway, just take a go. One God. You know about the Prophet? What did you say? I heard it somewhere. Beliefs, basic beliefs. Beliefs, basic beliefs, right? Anyone else? Day of judgment. Yourself. Thank you. That's what he says. He says the first thing you need to know to be a Muslim is to know yourself. In the nation of Islam, some of you know about the history of Islam in America. In the 1930s, there was an organization uh, that was founded that was like a, they call, it, they call them proto-Islamic or some say pseudo-Islamic movements. Right? The nation, in the nation of Islam, which Elijah Muhammad founded and led, that uh, made Islam a household name in America. Before that, people didn't know about Islam. Right? They had, I always have to make this disclaimer because otherwise people start saying, oh, you know, he's in the, is he in the nation? <laughs> While we have irreconcilable 
differences, theological differences with the nation of Islam. While we Muslims have irreconcilable differences with theological differences with the nation of Islam, there it was and there still is tremendous benefit in the organization, in the community. A lot of benefit, but that's a whole other conversation. Right? But one of the things they emphasized back then in the 1930s, and they still do in the 2020s, is knowledge of self. That's, that's number one. They got that right. Now, their understanding of knowledge of self did, wasn't as, ex, as, is not as expansive as Imam Ghazali's, but there is some overlap. Imam Ghazali says, the first thing you need to know to be a Muslim is know yourself. Who are you? What are you? Not just who are you, what are you? What are you? What are you? And what are you made of? What are the different dimensions that make you, you? He talks about all of this. Then the second thing he says you need to know after knowing yourself is know God. To be a Muslim. This is being Muslim. This is chapter one. And then the third thing he says you need to know is the nature of this world. Like we jump, our pedagogy is is very different than Imam Ghazali's pedagogy. Even though we say his name, we claim him, we, you know, we try to be Ghazalian, and but his pedagogy was very, very. Yeah, he was very deliberate. The nature of this world. We haven't even gone to the day of judgment yet. And then the fourth thing that we need to know to be Muslims is the nature of the next world. Knowledge of yourself. Knowledge of Allah, knowledge of this world, knowledge of the next world. Like that is Islam 101. Islam 101. So may Allah Ta'ala give us success, you know, to know ourselves, uh, inwardly and outwardly, you know. To know the surface and to know the depths, right? To know the physical and the, the metaphysical. May Allah Ta'ala give us success to uh, make reflection and contemplation, to make it a part of our day to our daily routines. May Allah Ta'ala give us success to appreciate other, each other. May Allah Ta'ala give us success uh, to strengthen the bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood between us. May Allah Ta'ala give us success to appreciate the earth and the sky and everything between them. Uh, may Allah Ta'ala give us success to embody the teachings of Imam Al-Haddad in the Book of Assistance and whatever books of benefit, uh, whatever wisdom we read, may Allah Ta'ala give us success to embody the principles and the ideals for his pleasure and nothing else in our lifetimes. May Allah Ta'ala make us uh, beacons of guidance and beacons of light wherever we go. May Allah Ta'ala make us channels of compassion and, and, and empathy and empowerment wherever we live. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala forgive us. May Allah pardon us. May Allah Ta'ala show us compassionate love in this life before the next life. May Allah Ta'ala make us one with the Qur'an. May Allah Ta'ala make us one with the Qur'an. May Allah Ta'ala make us one with the Qur'an. May Allah Ta'ala make us one with the Qur'an. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, make us walking Qur'ans, Ya Allah. O Allah, make us walking Qur'ans. O Allah, we, we know that you know the needs of all those that are here, Ya Allah. We ask that you fulfill all of our needs, those that are worldly, those that are otherworldly, those that are religious and spiritual and economic and social, political, financial, Allah, and our relationships, O Allah, mend our relationships, Ya Allah. We ask that you mend our broken relationships, Ya Allah. We ask that you enrich those that are that are impoverished, Ya Allah, inwardly and outwardly, Ya Allah. O Allah, we ask that you teach those that are ignorant. We ask that you give 
practice to those that are not practicing, that you give sincerity to those that are practicing, Ya Allah. We ask that we are detached from everything other than you, Ya Allah, while we are working in this world to benefit your creatures, Ya Allah, to serve your Prophet Sallallahu and to express and embody humble adoration of you. Ya Rabbil Alam. Ya Allah, we pray for the Islamic Center of NYU. We ask, O oh Allah, that you always connect this space with the heavens, Ya Allah, that you always connect this space with your throne, Ya Allah, with your magnificent throne. O oh Allah, we ask that you preserve and that you protect our dear teacher, our dear friend, our brother, Imam Khalid Latif, and his wife, and his children, and his staff, and his and the volunteers that are here, that, that anyone who enters this space, Ya Allah, that they receive awakening and enlightenment, and your mercy, Ya Allah, and, and, your, and your knowledge, and your closeness, Ya Allah, but I mean, oh Allah, we ask that you that you bless this city, Ya Allah. We ask that you rain down your mercy upon this city and upon this state, and that you make it a place where justice and where peace and where joy is manifest, Ya Rabbil Alameen, where Allahumma salli ala Sidina Muhammad, al-Fatih lima ugrik wa khatim lima sabak, nasiru haq bil haq wa al-hadi la siratik al-mustaqim, wa ala alihi haq wa qadrihi wa migdarihi al-azim, O Allah, we ask that you exalt our leader, our beloved leader, Muhammad, the opener of what was closed, the seal of what preceded the helper of the truth through the truth and the gentle guide to your straight path along with his family in accord with his greatness and immense rank ya rabbal alamin subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun assalamu alaykum wa salam alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin jazakum khairan ima khalid thank you alhamdulillah um I would just say this, because uh, we have a little time left, uh, that uh, I, I've been in the United States for the past three months on a book tour. Um, I uh, And my dear friend, Sheikh Talut Dawood, uh, translated this book from classical Arabic. It's a book uh, written by the great polymath. A polymath is like someone who has 30 PhDs and can write a book in each discipline that's authoritative. Imam al-Suyuti. And it's a book titled Raf al-Shad al-Hubshad, which I translate for good reasons. I won't go into all of them, but I translate as the excellence of black people. And this book uh, that, that we translated, it's this is... Uh, an abridgment of the book, uh, we translated it and titled it The Spirits of Black Folk because it uh, highlights the lives of early, uh, of, of black Muslims in early Islam. It is a very important book that can bring a lot of healing to our community, a lot of knowledge to our community. It also highlights Imam Suyuti, who lived 500 years ago. So he's not a woke you know, imam. He's not like critical race theory out or anything like that. This was a man who lived in Egypt in the pre-modern period. And he wrote this book about black people. He wasn't black. His mother was Circassian. She was Turkic. His father was Persian. He was not black. And he, like about 11 or 12 other scholars before him, spanning over a period of a thousand years, decided to write this book. He's not the only one. Many scholars have written books about the excellence of black people in Islam. And so I've been talking about this book and then maybe another time in the future, for Allah gives us life, inshallah ta'ala, I'll, I'll be able to share that with you and we'll be able to discuss it. Um, and, but it's a very blessed book. It is not just a book about black people. It's a book about the language in the Quran. It's a book about hadith. There are holes. When I, after you know, studying this um, and translating it, I realized that, and I don't say this lightly, there are holes in our knowledge of the seerah and our knowledge of the life of Prophet Muhammad that this helps to fill. There are things where, that we should be teaching in Sunday school and Saturday school and 
our Islamic studies courses, and even at the university level that are being missed, things that are significant, that are in books, and this book and books like it. It's a book for everybody. Um, and it's a book of deep spirituality. And, and, and if you like hadith, if you're that kind of person who like, you know, like you read a book by Jonathan Brown or you know, a book by Ibn Hajar Asqalani and it kind of excites you, you know, he was a he was a hadith scholar. So there's a lot of hadith terminology and hadith science uh, in the book as well. So uh, so please pray for me and, and pray for that Allah spread the book because you can publish a book and no one knows about it. It ends up in a library somewhere and collects dust. So we hope that Allah makes it a benefit. Jazakumullah khairan. Alhamdulillah. Just a few quick things before Sheikh Mendez is out. Uh, one, if y'all can join me in just making dua for the Sheikh that Allah increases him and his loved ones and all that's good and makes him a continued source of benefit for his creation. Um, uh, I've had the blessing of knowing Sheikh Mendez for some time, and you all have known me for a while. We get to go around a lot, meet a lot of people, and there's definitely a lot of people, mashallah, who we take knowledge from who are amazing, but it's really sometimes hard to find people who also are just good people. And tonight you get to spend some time with somebody who just doesn't talk about this theme but lives this theme. And it's really our blessing to be in your company, Sheikh. May Allah bless you and preserve you and increase you and keep you always from amongst the closest and most righteous of the servants. And we definitely have an open invite whenever you're visiting. We'd love to have you here, your family. Uh, we're going to do an event, inshallah, where we're going to circulate the links to the book. Um, I have a copy of it. It's an amazing text. And as we're in advance of the event, uh, prepping ourselves so that when Sheikh Mendez returns, we have some familiarity with the text um, prior to his coming, uh, and we'll then be able to delve into it a little, a little deeper, inshallah. Right, and the point down the sira is very critical. You know, I had teachers who said, if you're going to study Quran, you have to study the sira first. Mm -hmm because it removes now the backdrop of what is theoretical and roots it in simply what is concrete. And you're not able to then remove the context of where this revelation is being sent down and takes away conjecture and assumption that sometimes unfortunately renders a lot of the challenges that we find in many of our communities today. And we all know that there are immense gaps that exist and very deliberate, not, you know, unfortunately things that are done by chance, but deliberate uh, processes that purposely seek to exclude and marginalize um, voices. And many of us who come from immigrant communities need to recognize that those who preceded us generationally made a conscious decision that when they came here just some decades ago to work with established white structures rather than working with established Muslim communities that have been here for centuries and understanding that that also is a product of gaps in knowledge in our own socialization with this religion. And so as a text, it's a text that is a means of benefit for all of us should we choose to simply engage the text for what it was intended for. So, inshallah, we're going to have the shaykh back uh, to be able to benefit and to walk through the text to understand it at a deeper level, but encourage all of you to, to get it beforehand. Um, and then a couple of other quick things. Uh, I wanted everybody, um, our brother Solo, everyone knows Solo, you want to raise your hand? Solo is going to Tanzania tomorrow for six weeks. Um, so if you don't see him around, it's not because he got you know married or something. <laughs> uh, maybe he did. We don't know. But he makes special dua. Uh, Solo leads up our converts group here. Mashallah, he's always helping around. Um, always has a smile on his face. Um, may Allah grant you a safe journey. Yeah. Suffer so much. Yeah. We're gonna miss you a lot. But definitely don't forget us and you know come back quick. Um, but keep solo in your du'as if you can. And then just a few other quick announcements um, before we conclude. 
on Friday night, our brother Amir Suleiman is going to be here. It's the third segment in our Black Muslim Lecture Series. Uh, if you missed the first two, you definitely missed a lot. And make sure you don't miss the third. Um, there's going to be discussion, dinner, performances. Instead of doing it in the lecture hall of this building, where we did the first two with Dr. Bilal Ware and Dr. Rasul Miller, um, we're going to be hosting in the fourth floor auditorium of the building next door. Uh, and so definitely come through and be a part of that. Next Friday, Dr. Rania Awad, um, who many of you might know, uh, she's on faculty at Stanford, traditionally trained as well as a uh, degree in clinical psychology, has done amazing work in terms of understanding the intersections between Islam and mental health. Uh, she'll be doing a program with us next Friday night, inshallah. And then another date that you want to save is December 3rd, which is going to be our last segment of the Black Mason Lecture Series for this year. Um, where uh, Brother Bashir Jones, uh, as well as Sheikh Aisha Prime, um, will be returning back to the IC since uh, she left her role here um, last December. And they'll both be speaking, and that's on a Saturday night, December 3rd. And that event we're doing in conjunction with an organization called the Continuous Charity. Um, and they particularly have launched a fund to provide, they provide interest-free loans in general to students, um, but they've launched a fund to provide loans in specific to um, black identifying students from low income backgrounds. And December 3rd will be a benefit towards that fund as well. So you can help us spread the word on all of those events and programs. Uh, we'd really appreciate it, inshallah. We're gonna be doing the rest of our regular um, Halakas and, and Rus over the course of the week, our community service projects. We'll send out more information. And this is the last announcement. Tonight there's going to be a uh, lunar eclipse, and we have uh, a recommended prayer to be done. It's going to be at around 4.15 in the morning. In the Hanafi school, it's not a, a prayer that is done in congregation necessarily because of the lateness of the hour. The other schools, Sheikh Mendez could probably give more insight on this. Um, it's performance, you know, if you're doing it at home, we're not open at four o'clock in the morning, so don't show up here. Don't come to my house also. At 4 o'clock in the my wife will not be happy if you start knocking on the door at 4.15. Uh, but it's a prayer that you want to engage in. Um, the recommendation is to make both salah and dua in the course of the duration of the eclipse itself. Um, and if, you know, one is a little shorter than the other, then you're compensating the time for the one that wasn't as short. Uh, in some schools, it's prayed differently than the regular two rak'ahs that you would normally pray, in that in each rak'ah, there's two recitations and two bounds. So you would make the intention for the two rak'ahs of the lunar eclipse prayer, and within it, you'd have Surah Fatiha, recitation of the Qur'an, and then you would bow, and then you would stand and do another recitation of Fatiha and Qur'an, and then bow again and complete that rakah with the normal course of prostrations and stand and follow cord. Um, but you also have an opinion that's just prayed the way you would pray regular two rakahs individually. And then it's prayed in congregation if you decide to do this. Um, there are opinions about having, similar to the Jummah prayer, um, mm -hmm. a two-part khutbah that would be done following the actual salah itself. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to it. Yeah, just, you know, I mean, what, what Imam Khalid said is correct. Um, you know, only that uh, the lunar eclipse is a great sign of Allah. It's a great sign of God, like the solar eclipse. And, you know, uh, when we do these prayers, we're acknowledging that uh, the disalignment is something that is, in, is incredible. It's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome um, natural phenomenon. And so we honor that by being in prayer for part or all of the eclipse. So don't just go out and watch it. I hope you see it. You know, is it total or partial? It's going to be a total, total, total so eclipse amazing. today and, and a full blood moon. It says. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. So you also want to take advantage of these things. So much of our tradition has these elemental aspects to it. You know, we were driving to Maryland this weekend and the sky on the way down to Maryland is very different than the sky in New York City. Mm. And my seven-year-old was looking at the sky as the sun was setting 
and he said, Baba, look at how beautiful it is. Mm. And he's seven, and sometimes I don't know how he talks the way he talks. Mm. Uh, but my wife and I are listening to him share with us. And I said, what does it look like to you, Kareem? And he said, Baba, it looks like the sky is telling us what it's feeling right now. Mm. Mm. I said, what is it telling you that it's feeling? He just continues on and on. You know, may Allah allow for him and all of us to have this type of vision and perspective because the sky doesn't know how beautiful it is. Only you and I can perceive its beauty, right? And so when you're in this time tonight, yeah, I think it's an opportunity that's not about just posting on social media, etc. But you actually go and look at the moon when it's in this beautiful, unique form. You take the opportunity to engage in the baraka of this window that only comes on occasion. And you want to try your best with it, right? If you go home and look it up, people are going to have things written that said that in the first rakah, recite Surah Bakara, in the second rakah, you know, you know, just try your best, right? Read what you know, you know, do it in the ways that you do, make dua, and inshallah Allah will accept and give you better than what it is that you're asking of Him. We're going to send out a description to the email list tonight uh, that explain how to do it, that can walk you through it as well, inshallah. Um, again, the people can stay seated. Sheikh Mendez has to catch his plate. I'll, so, I'll, if, you're allowed, if you're okay, I'd like to maybe take one question. <laughs> you can, I would like for you to stay here until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> one for the brothers and one for because I yeah. do want to hear from you. So, I think, do we have time for one? Well, maybe one from the brother, one from the sisters. Yeah. But just, you know, uh, uh, about the Lunar Eclipse prayer, um, to make it simple, and, you know, if you haven't memorized Al Baqarah and Al Ibrah, Nisa and Al Ma'ida, you, you just keep praying two rakats until the eclipse is over. Like, that's the optimal way to do it. But if you don't have the time, if you have to be at work in the morning, because the Lunar Eclipse could be four hours long, right? Uh, then you just pray two rakats during the eclipse. Right? And like Imam Khalid said, you make dua, and then you've done enough. Right? You've done enough. But if you have the time and the energy to actually observe the entire duration of the eclipse, you just keep praying two rakats and make dua. Two rakats, make dua. Two rakats, make dua until the eclipse is, is over. Does anybody have any questions? Or comments, comments, or anything you want to share. Oh. It's mine. So, um, my question is, for those who aren't, uh, Saturday you do dhikr uh, collectively, mm -hmm. for those who aren't like used to doing dhikr in Jamar or collectively, what's the best process and way of getting those individuals into dhikr and comfortability in that space? I, I would invite them to do dhikr individually, right? Um, uh, dhikr is something that can be done uh, you know, privately, individually, uh, and it's something that can be done collectively and publicly as well. I, I encourage people to just you know get in uh, where you fit in, as they say, right? whatever is comfortable to you. Uh, some people uh, they 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 flourish when they engage in private worship. There's certain aspects of our worship that are public, like Jumwa, right, like the congregational of the five prayers, like Eid, right? Uh, hajj, for instance, like no one can get around, like no one can say, you know, I just want to make Hajj by myself. Uh, you can't get away with that, right? There's certain things that we have to do with community. And there's something really powerful about that. But, you know, dhikr, yeah, if someone feels, uh, doesn't feel comfortable doing dhikr at a circle of people, then just uh, encourage them to do it alone. Yeah. And um, that's fine. What, what some scholars say is that uh, vicar in a group amplifies. It amplifies the impact of Allah's names on your soul. Yeah. But again, uh, you know, the thing about vicar is this. Like every time you say... La ilaha illallah. Or you say subhanallah or Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. It's like you're digging. Right? And each phrase you say, you're, it's like you're digging for water. If you're doing it alone, 
as opposed, so imagine a group of people digging a well versus you by yourself with your shovel, like digging. You're gonna get to water eventually, won't you, all right? It may take a little longer. It might, but Allah can make it easy. Allah might do. You know, so that's the only thing. Doing it with people might accelerate the, the impact of the dhikr on your soul. Uh, but Allah is merciful. You know, a person could be by themselves and Allah makes it very easy for their soul to become illumined. Any of the ladies? Uh, I don't know who had their hand up first. So I see two hands. And the green, the green scarf? Yeah. Is that green? Sometimes I'm colorblind. <laughs> oh, turquoise. Is it turquoise? <laughs> I'm colorblind. You said, oh, salam, sorry. Well, I can sit down. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Why do you think? Yeah. Why? Why? Why do you think? Yeah. I would say that. Knowing yourself allows you to worship God in a sense way possible. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we all have the purpose of our mind, we can manifest those purposes uh, in a way that you are people on, like, in the best way of what you are. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense, yeah. So, so self-knowledge enables you to worship Allah uh, in accordance with your own unique constitution. Is that what you're saying? Your, yeah, your temperament, right? Yeah, I think that's that's uh, very significant. Uh, Imam Ghazali, you know, to my understanding, when he talks about knowing yourself, uh, you know, he he mentions he starts. You know, I, I really believe, you know, based on what I've read and what I've heard, uh, you know, from my teachers is that he wants to introduce you to yourself, to your faculties and capabilities in order to evoke a sense of, 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 of marvel, of gratitude for how amazing you are as a human being. Uh, you are the uh, imagine if you could take the whole the entire universe and put that universe into one being. That's you. Right. We know, but the thing is, we're not taught that in elementary school. We're not taught that in high school. And you, you know, most of us are not taught that in college or by our parents even. Again, just I just want us to to put our minds around this. Allah has taken the whole universe and put it into you. You are a microcosm of everything in the universe. And that's not just poetry. I'm not just waxing poetic. You know, we have scientists that now, like, like when you hear, like, when you hear Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, the astrophysicist, yeah. when he talks about how we are the stuff of stars, like every element, that's in the stars is in us. And the same is true for the soil. All of the trace elements that are in the in the soil are in us, right? Iron and magnesium and gold and silver. You know, they're all in us. You know, so uh, even our prayer, right? The prayer is a reflection of that. When you pray, when you stand in Qiyam, you are representing the human world. But when you bow, you're representing the animal world because most animals are hunched over, right? They walk on force. And when you prostrate, you're representing the plant world because scientists mention that, for example, trees, that their, their brain is, in their, is at the root, is at the base of their roots. Right, and when you sit in ju in jalsa, 
you're representing the mineral world, the rocks, and, you know, like it's all in our prayer. And again, I didn't make that up. It's you know, this is I've read this and learned this from my teachers and their texts that go into all of this. I mean, Ahmed even Ajiba even goes into how the rivers. And, I mean, he goes into every part of your body and how it reflects some aspect of nature, of the earth and the sky. Like it's all in us, physically and metaphysically. So I, I think that Imam Ghazali talks about all of this and talks about the body and its qualities and talks about the, the, the self, the nafs, its qualities and characteristics. And he talks about the heart, the qalb, the dil in, in Urdu and its qualities and its powers. He has a section in his magnum opus, the Ihya'lumadim, the revival of the sciences of the way uh, the 20th chapter is called Aja'ib al-Qalb, the marvels of the heart, right? And then he talks about the spirit. That's when things get really amazing, right? I think it's to engender this sense of, 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 of gratitude. And so when you begin to experience this shukr, that he teaches you, okay, who the one thankfulness is owed is. So he starts with gratitude. You know, so. The last sheep, you know. We, uh, follow, that? we don't follow the masses. You know, yeah. we're Muslim because we believe Allah is, you know, exists and we're not just, you know, because people think, oh, we're, follow, we're praying the same, the same direction, we're one, but we're not one, we're right? unique. Everyone's unique. You said everyone's unique? And yes, like yeah. in, in our salah and our, yes, something. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, are you talking about Muslims or yeah, us as individuals? Individuals as Muslims. Yeah, yeah. We're all bringing something. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Muslims are unique. Yes. Uh, each of us as human beings are unique, but, but we're also the same. Yeah. <laughs> same blood. Like, they cut me, they cut you. Yeah. All right, it's red. It might be a different blood type, right? But you bleed red, I bleed red, right? I get hungry, you get hungry, you know? I get happy, you get happy. Like there, there's so there's a sameness to us, but there's also variety and diversity, which is what makes things beautiful. Like we're talking about that. Yeah, and the same thing goes with the religions. There are things in Islam that are unique and distinct. Like this whole thing about our religions are the same, hogwash. Yeah. It's not true. It's not only the only people who say that are people who've never studied religions. All religions are not the same, right? But there are aspects of different religions, especially revealed religions, that are similar, right? There are ethical principles that are shared, you know, morals that are shared, cosmology that is shared. You know, there there is there are certain aspects that are shared. So it's it's there there yes there, there is a distinction with Islam and our prayer, but then you could also see that our prayer captures and gathers the different ways that Allah is worshipped by different religions. Like you see Jews pray and Christians pray. And, you know, yeah. So we are special, but not that much. <laughs> we'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khairan. Forgive me uh, for having to go. Allah bless you all. May Allah ta'ala give you light on your journey. Uh, you know, listening to that lineup, I wish I could stay here for the next few months. And, and these are all really amazing, blessed people. Uh, and, uh, you know, please, and I'm sure you're already doing this, but, you know, thank Allah for Imam Khalid. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's having good teachers uh, is rare. You know, that's, that's you know, there are people that, that move across the country to find a good teacher. Yeah. So alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum. <laughs>